we know that inequality is not inevitable and it's indefensible that inequality means some lives are shorter than others, that some live in poverty while others flourish, while uh, some are marginalised and dismissed while others gain power. Now to hear the stories of people living on the sharp end of inequality is heartbreaking, but it's also incredibly motivating. We should want to take action and I'm seeing some of the words you've been putting in the chat. We should want to channel that anger, that frustration, that heartbreak into organising, into acting. And it can feel daunting not knowing what to do to fight inequality, but I know that all of you've made a start by joining the Equality Trust here today, this evening, to start thinking about that. Uh, and first up, I'm very happy to hand over to Ben Phillips, author of this very good book, where you can see I've made lots of notes already on how to fight inequality and why that fight needs you. So over to Ben, thank you. Thanks so much, Fran, and it's so wonderful to be with all of you for this really, really important conversation. It's a huge privilege to get to be with you and to get to hear your questions and your reflections. These words that people are putting in the chat, angry, dire, frustrated, gross, furious, people can feel inequality. There used to be a time when, when I was talking about inequality, I had to explain why it was bad. You know, and I used to often refer, in fact, to Richard Wilkinson's book, the one he wrote with Kate Pickett, called The Spirit Level, that explains why inequality is a public bad, that the worse inequality gets, the worse violent crime gets, the worse health problems get, the worse stress gets. It's a bit like pulling the elastic. You pull and pull and pull, and then eventually it snaps. Society is like that. Inequality holds back progress on social mobility, tackling poverty, social cohesion, peace, and democracy. The IMF even says it's bad for the economy. And just talk to people like Greenpeace, they'll tell you it's bad for the environment too. And in this crisis, the ILO has noted that workers worldwide have lost $3.7 trillion, whilst billionaires have gained $3.9 trillion. In other words, there's been a transfer of about $4 trillion from workers to billionaires. So I used to have to talk about why inequality was bad, but I don't have to anymore. Now people say, get on with it. Tell us what we can do about it. The wonderful thing is that everybody here, everybody in this conversation, isn't really just interested in wanting to understand inequality better. They want to do something about it. They want to overcome it. And that's why the Equality was tr Trust was established. That's why Richard and Kate brought it together. It's about people organizing. It's about the doers. And we're going to hear this evening from two amazing groups. One of them is the Birmingham Equality Group. Dan's going to talk about that. And the other is the Bolo Brook Youth Centre that Ami and Lawand are going to talk about. Now, I found it so inspiring to hear from them and to get to know them, and I know that you will too. But I want to tell you my worry. My worry is, is that when you hear them, you'll be so impressed that you'll say, wow, I could never do that. And you'll look at them like people look at Simone Biles doing a pole vault. I don't want you to do that. I want you to recognise that they were nervous too when they started. They didn't stand up when they were ready. They got ready by standing up, being knocked down, standing up, being knocked down. And also that they can't do it alone. If you're inspired when you hear from Dan and you hear from Aoi and Lawan, remember that they'll fail unless you join them. Change is never won by a few heroes working on their own. It's only ever won when there's enough of us together. Now this crisis, this COVID crisis is grim. But there's a really interesting thing about crises is that they are moments when suddenly things are possible. Now, that doesn't mean that things are going to get better. It could mean, in fact, that things get worse. You could think of a crisis a bit like heat and social structures or the way we live a bit like glass. So a glass blower, they put the glass under flame. They put it under heat. And that glass, it's really hard. It's suddenly bendable. So in this crisis, everything is suddenly bendable. But in which direction will it bend? Well, that depends on in which direction it gets pushed and how hard. When I wrote the book, How to Fight Inequality, I looked back at a century and a half of history about the evidence of how inequality can be overcome. And the good news is that it can be. And the other good news is that we know what works. Now, in Latin America, from about the year 2000 to about 2010 or 2015, eight to 11 countries substantially reduced inequality. And then if you look back at the 20th century, many more did. It ends, sadly, in around 1975 or 1980.
but it starts in newly independent African and Asian countries in the 50s and 60s. It starts in Europe in 1945 and parts of Europe from before, and it starts in the US from the 1930s. So all across the world, we saw in the 20th century as well, big reductions in inequality until about 1980. Now, what do they all have in common? Here's what they ha all have in common. All of them were about policy. It was never corporate resp social responsibility or just a few NGO projects or um, just the market. It was always government policy. It was things like putting money in the hands of ordinary people, wage increases and rights at work, expansion of public services, progressive taxation, land reform, tackling discrimination, things like that. But the other thing that's really interesting is this, is that it was never dependent only on good leaders. They always required pressure from below every single time. Now, President Lyndon B. Johnson famously said this to Martin Luther King, I know what I have to do, but you have to make me do it. If we want leaders to do something, we're going to have to make them do it. So what are the lessons? The first lesson is build power by organizing. There's no justice, just us, people have told me. In Latin America, it was the landless workers movement. It was the indigenous people. I met with an amazing community in Brazil called the Colombolo community. They are the descendants of people who'd been enslaved and then had fled to the forest. And they'd been living in the forest and they'd been doing okay because the forest wasn't work, worth anything. Then suddenly it was worth something and it wasn't technically their land, although it was the only home they'd ever had. And they were being pushed out. So what did they do? They organized. They managed to get minimum wage, minimum price for their goods. And they managed to get a change in the law that they, they have the right now to those uh, coconuts in that forest. Here's what they told me. They said, when we are on our own, we're small. But when we're organized, we're visible. Everything we got, they said, has come through the power of our friendship. On their t-shirts, it says, organizadas somos fortes, which means organized, we're strong. If we look at independence for African and Asian countries, we see that it wasn't just about transferring rule from the West to indigenous people. It was about changing society. And that's why, for example, in Ghana, it was led by the cocoa workers. And the cocoa workers ensured that when independence came, we also shifted the money that was going into the country from going to a tiny few to going to the population. And that's how they ended up with free education, first for cocoa workers, then for everyone else. In the US from the 1930s to 1970s, that too was from pressure from below. There's like a kind of Venn diagram where you see black organizations, trade unions, activist groups, people like A. Philip Randolph were in the middle of that as a black activist trade unionist. So it's always about movement. And when I talk about movement, I wanna be really clear, it wasn't about individual heroes. You might know the story of the Montgomery bus boycott. That's when black people in the States refused to sit on the back of the bus. A lot of people know that story as Rosa Parks on her own, one day was tired and refused to move. And then Martin Luther King gave a speech and then everything changed. That is not what happened. A group of African-American women of whom Rosa Parks was one planned it for over two years. And it took another year of organizing afterwards. Martin Luther King was not the organizer. He said to himself, I'm, I wasn't my idea. I'm not leading it. I've simply been asked to come and support it. Now to make this work, to beat that bus company, they had to plot where everybody lived and how they were gonna get to work. They had to work with a postman to do that. They had to work with every church in the town to do that. It was logistics, it took time. And there's a wonderful story about the role of academics because sometimes academics think maybe my role is to be the big guru. The biggest contribution that academics made to the Montgomery bus boycott was a bunch of posters were needed to be printed and only people in universities had those printing machines. So university staff against the law illegally printed posters. They literally got their hands dirty. It was won by the whole community. Now, we see this too in the Scandinavian welfare state. A lot of people might be really impressed by Scandinavia and think maybe Scandinavia always used to be equal, but it didn't. It used to be a brutal feudal society with starvation. When people first started organizing, Norway's government organized strike breakers. They organized militia. They killed people on strike. But because people held together, that's how they won this change that now we think of as Scandinavian. Cesar Chavez, who organized farm workers in the US, he put it so well, he said this, we don't need perfect political systems, we need perfect participation. So that's the first lesson, organize. What's the second lesson? Second lesson is create a story. 
because there's no one policy that's going to win us a more equal society. We're going to have to need to keep pressing government for years and years and years. We can't do that unless we hold together with stories. Now, sometimes people who are progressive, they say, well, I just believe in science. I'm technical and I believe in expertise. I don't like myths. I don't like stories. But if you don't like myths and stories, then we'll lose. The great trade union organizer, Joe Hill said, a pamphlet, no matter how good, will be read once and then tossed away. Whereas a song is learned by heart over and over again. Think about the beautiful music track of the civil rights movement. Think about the phrase welfare state. That didn't come from a politician that came from the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, who was talking about how we change society after the horrors of war. There's a beautiful Mexican movie called Roma, and I hope you go see it. It's about a domestic worker. Something really special came after that movie came out, which was that for the first time in Mexico, there was a law to protect the rights of domestic workers. And yet that movie makes zero policy recommendations, but it changed the story. There's a beautiful saying that I learned in Ireland, and it's this. History is written by the rulers, but the sufferers write the songs. And in the end, the music wins. What's the third lesson? The third lesson is to be a troublemaker. Sometimes people think that, let's say you're organizing and you get an angry phone call with a politician that you've messed up, or that people around you say you're too disruptive, that you've messed up, you haven't. Sometimes now in the States, people will say about Black Lives Matter, why can't they be more like Martin Luther King? But in 1966, 63% of Americans said that Martin Luther King was divisive. Civil rights leader John Lewis talked about the importance of good trouble. Every successful movement I've found that successfully tackled inequality was at the beginning criticized for being trouble. That even counts for the suffragettes who were only asking, why can't women vote? So when we look back at history, we see that there's hope, but we also see that that hope will not come from great leaders, but will come from us. One way of thinking about this, if you think about a sports game, sometimes we imagine that we are in the, 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 the seats that we're watching, but we're not. We're on the pitch. We're playing. Alone, we're weak, but together, we're strong. There's a beautiful phrase in Latin America, and you might know it. It goes like this. The people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. Now, the sad thing is that is not true. The people united are often defeated. But here's what is true. The people disunited are always defeated. So though resistance doesn't always work, acceptance always doesn't work. So if we challenge power, if we build power together, and if we craft a new story about how power can be wielded for the public good, we're not definite to win, but it's the only way in which people have won in the past. In other words, whether or not we end up with a more equal society is up to me and you. Thanks, everyone, and I look forward to making it with you. Take care. Thank you so much for that, Ben. Um, that was great, and it you know it really resonates with um, you know what we what we are doing here today, where we are demonstrating the power of people coming together and actually putting in the work. And like you say, this isn't to um, to hold people up as um, paragons of amazing kind of activism, but just to show that it's ordinary people like me, like you, like everybody here. That are really so essential um, to this fight and as you say we can't win if we don't fight and that you know is one of the reasons that so many people have come here um, this evening um, what i just wanted to say was if you have any questions for ben um, or for um, dan for amy and loand please put them in the chat and what we will be doing is picking those up and then there's a, a really good opportunity um, nearer the end um where those questions will be picked up and there's a really good q a section and we really want to invite people to share their thoughts and to you know just kind of have a have a conversation and hopefully this conversation will you know carry on after the event um what i am going to do is um my colleague cerise is going to be um 
we're just going to have a, a kind of a short break for just five minutes where there's going to be um, a short video. Um, we can't do any of this work um, without you. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we are always kind of, um, you know, we are doing a fundraiser as well tonight. So I will be putting our donation link in the chat. If everybody could just contribute, you know, whatever, whatever you can, we massively appreciate it. And it just enables us to be able to amplify the voices, those at the sharp end of inequality, and to facilitate and to support people in uh, local areas to organize. So I'm just gonna pop that in the chat now. And uh, my colleague Cerise is just gonna show a short video that really shows and really demonstrates the, the work that everybody has been doing this year. is the UK national charity and we work to improve the quality of life in the UK by reducing economic and social inequality through campaigning, advocacy and supporting a range of local groups um, and young people to achieve change at a national, local and individual level. <laughs> had one crisis where we didn't deal with inequality and we know how that pans out we know it leads to an increasing spiral of ever decreasing affordable housing and wages not rising do you want that again there's lots of things i could say um but i mean one of the things i want to sort of finish by saying really is is just that if we want to take poverty seriously if we want to really address the poverty then we really do have to take seriously uh, the experiences of those living at the sharp end of poverty and we've got to do it in a way that sees them as equal and whole participants. Covid has shown us that we can be flexible, we can change things and we can put um, that the human back into humanity in terms of our service delivery, in terms of our design and in terms of when we talk about poverty. So the inequality we saw pre-pandemic is exacerbated in the pandemic. It's easy to think, well, if the rich make cash, how am I affected? Well, house prices will go up and your kids won't get houses. Stock prices will go up and your kids won't be able to afford a pension. And prices in the shops will go up and your kids' lives will get worse. I mean, fundamentally, if you give cash to the rich and not to the poor, then when we all go out to buy things with that money, the rich will get more things and the poor will get fewer things. <laughs> Inequality defines our times, but it doesn't have to be our fate. And whilst COVID has made inequality even harder to bear, this moment of crisis could paradoxically provide an opportunity for us to break out of that spiral of ever widening inequality, if we seize our moment. Since joining the Equality Trust, I have been able to learn how to facilitate events and I've had the opportunity to facilitate a discussion with a few incredibly inspirational young grassroots activists in conversations geared around gender and racial inequality. The Young Equality Campaigners have allowed me to expand my depth and breadth of knowledge on what equality and inequality looks like and it has also given me better access to the world of campaigning. I've managed to host some awe-inspiring events with some great speakers, such as speakers from Our Streets Now and also um, financial and racial inequality experts. Perhaps the biggest thing though is that I've learned about how inequality can manifest itself in the real world and I've also learned the key skills of hosting and facilitating events. Employment rights are a necessity for life. It's outrageous that it's not being taught in schools more often. Justice has never been given. 
it has only ever been won. Thank you. So I can see there's some questions already coming in, which is brilliant. Um, and at this point in the, the event, what we really wanted to do is, you know, given how um, despondent and negative um, the comments were originally in the, in the um, chat, we would be really interested just to find out now kind of how you're, you know, how you're feeling on a scale of one to five in terms of you know, how you feel, how inspired you're currently feeling to tackle inequality. So five being very inspired um, with one being um, less, you know, at the, at the lower end of the scale. So if you could just pop in the chat, you know, how you're feeling at the moment, and then we will hear from some more from some more campaigners. Oh, seven, amazing. Okay, so it looks like people are feeling a bit more positive, maybe, um, than, than when the event started in terms of how they're feeling around tackling inequality. Um, what I'm gonna do now is introduce you to two um, really impressive, um, young activists who have been um, working, um, you know, we've been kind of working with them over two or three years um, around their artistic activism. Um, they are co-creators of the website imnotyour.co.uk, which I will put in the chat so you can um, access that, which is a, is a kind of online manifestation of their um, of the exhibition, which is actually currently being um, having a showing for two months at the Pitts Hanger Gallery um, in Ealing. Um, they are um, Loand Omar and Ami Karuma, um, and they're going to have a conversation about the about um, how that work came about. And so I'm just going to hand over to them now. So thank you, Ami and Loand. Uh, thank you very much, Ami. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Great. Uh, yeah, so um, just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Laund Omar. Uh, I'm a first year student at Manchester University studying history and economics. And I've been involved at Bolo since I was around 16. Um, excuse me, just getting involved in um, a lot of the local projects we've had and just engaging with, yeah, just been in involved in Bolo since since then and it's been a blast. Um, my name is Ami, I'm 20 years old and I've been going to Bolo since I was 15. Um, I first attended Bolo after an incident I had with a wooden gun. Um, there was six automatic rifles and armed police that came for me because they thought I had a weapon. I was put in a cell for nine hours with a fractured arm. And then after I was refused to see the evidence or what charges they had me on. The, 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 sorry, the description that they had of me was a school kid in a colorful bag. And that's practically the whole high street. So um, I came to Bolo and like, at first I didn't really grasp what happened to me. Like I kind of shrugged it off a bit, but like, coming to Bolo and talking to Colin and Yasmin and all the staff, like it kind of made me open up and see like what happened to me was, was unjust. Like it wasn't right, it wasn't fair. Like I shouldn't accept that. So yeah, and now I'm working as a safeguarding apprentice in the Eden Council. Yes, so um, I think what we were planning to do um, within this sort of presentation was just talk about the projects we've been involved in at Bolo and our experiences uh, within these projects and how it sort of links with activism 
quote unquote. Um, and I feel, I feel as if the first real project we worked on was um, I'm not your um, N-word um, project, which was particularly inspired after um, us watching a James Bolden documentary called I'm Not Your Negro, um, exp exploring the experiences of James Baldwin. And we sort of took that to Bono, I guess. Um, and I just wanted to ask Ami uh, what actually happened within the project and what did we actually do? Um, so like after that, it kind of just took off really. Like it first started as, as you said, like conversations in studio and just idle chat in the office to like this thing that people want to hear about and see. So we basically just constructed this idea of like, what do we want to show? So basically Yasmin spoke to us, she got like, a couple of ideas and she decided to make a wire head. So it's basically like this, how tall, it's taller than me and I'm like 5'11". So like a six foot head, plainly made out of wire and paper. And then she added like, put pieces of mash, I think. Yeah, little like, mash, yeah. But she also like left a bit of the wire out and put like our baby photos or things that like resonate with a place we feel that's safe. So like it could be Bolo or our grand's house or somewhere. And she fit those pieces in between the wire and then we held an exhibition. And then after that, we went to the tape and we held another one where we basically had the space and we created a box for the I'm Not Your Nigger exhibition. They recorded our conversations and debates that we had in Bolo. So people just walking by, like I'm saying we had a lot of traffic, we're talking about 150 people, just lining up to listen to like what we were saying, like conversations that we wasn't really too deep into. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was more, a lot of the project was having conversations around the N-word is just very normalized within the youth, uh, the youth center. Like everyone says it very freely. How do you think that project really changed the way a lot of the young people there, um, how they engage with their N word and how, to, how it sort of changed their perception of racism? Because a lot of the times, a lot of young people get patronized when we talk about social issues like racism. So the fact that we had very very intense conversations about it and we had a lot to say about it well, what's what's your experience of it um and what did you see when when everyone was talking about the use of the n-word at bolo i mean at first of course like i was naive like i wasn't really thinking too much into it first the first question of this it was do you think it's appropriate for you to be using the n-word in your lyrics in your music and you degrade yourself or other men or women. And then it just like erupted into some people thinking, oh, like it's just music and others people thinking like it's just straight disrespectful. So then after that, it wasn't really like who can win the argument. It was more of, okay, I want to see why you disagree with me so we can come to one conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, that sort of links in with, with, with our second project. I mean, the one that's being showed at Pitts Hanger right now. Um, it's called Who Are We? Navigating Race, Class and the City. Um, and it, it includes a lot of the uh, work we did with the I'm Not Your N-Word project. Um, so we, we had an um, audio installation. So it was a big box um, with, with um, giving voice to experiences of race and racism. Uh, we had um, the light box pictures, uh, which examines how young people are perceived by others. Um, and the main, the main work that we have in the exhibition is a film called Banda that me and you worked on, Ami, um, and explores the perceived lack of choice faced by young people, by marginalized young people. Um, we both worked on the script, you worked more so on the production. Um, what, what was the point of the Bandol film and why was it important? The point of the Bandol film, like the sole point, not the script, not the, like, the ideas that the people had in the group, our, just, our sole purpose was to like, highlight the issues that these young people go through 
in the most realistic, honest way possible. So for example, in the film, Bando's about a group of young boys finding an empty house and the older boys crashing it, meaning that they've invaded the space and now they're cohabitating. So the younger boys are technically getting groomed. And we're basically trying to highlight like, it's not your average way of looking at it. Like it's actually deeper than that. So to just kind of show our young people to like, we understand, we know, and to be well for yourself, of course. And then the, we literally was picking actors off like the street. We were like, do you want to be in a movie? Do you want to be in a movie? Do you want to be in a movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wanted it to be really a, like a community led effort. And all the kids came down on the set day, 8 a.m., finishing late at night on their feet consistently. Like this was during like Ramadan time. So some of them were fasting and like everything had, everyone like put their all into it. The director, Aaron and Matthias, producer, like they got all the free pro like Brono stuff for us. They got it properly edited and graded and like it looks amazing. So it was just hard work and effort from everyone. Yeah, well, it was a proper authentic film and now it really did show the, the realities of a lot of people within our area and whatnot, um, showing the, rea the realities of our, of our situation is often, um, is often what's needed as a lot of people, um, don't want to use the terms like people in their ivory tower, but a lot of people are completely devoid of understanding our, our lived realities and experiences. Um, so I think, yeah, having a film like Bando that's been made and produced by us and shows our perception of what life really is like to like other people who wouldn't really understand that sort of lifestyle is, is, is proper sick, I won't lie. Yeah. So you got involved with Bolo from your work at the UK Youth Parliament. How is that activism different from the stuff you were doing here? Um, yeah, so basically I got I got involved in um, this organization called UK Youth Parliament, I'd say around that like five, six years ago, when I was trying to get involved in youth-led activism. And it was a bit as as with most youth-led activisms campaigns, whatever, it was it was very patronizing and it sort of embodied how a lot of yeah, youth activism is. It, it's never really led by young people. It doesn't really take their issues seriously. And and from the projects we've done at Bolo, there's clearly a lot that young people can say it just needs to be articulated in the right in in the in the right way for quote unquote middle class people to understand. Um, and and the main thing is that there's sort of this need for young people to be put in the context of a campaign. And that's not really what anything, that's not, that's nothing like what's happened at Bono. Um, issue-based campaigns are often very dogmatic. Whilst we were more issue, um, always more interested in starting a conversation, changing the way people engage with each other, with everything we did from the, the conversations around the N-word um, to the light boxes, to even the bundle film. It was, it was never about trying to change people's opinions per se, but trying to change the way people engage with, with these issues. People are really, like I said earlier, people are quite devoid of the lives that us young people live uh, within, within Acton, West London. That's why, for example, the Guardian podcast on Bollabrook Youth Centre, uh, on the experiences of two young people, uh, was the most listened to Guardian podcast um, within, I think, 2019. Um, and, and I think that's what we've been trying to do at Bolo, change the way people engage with each other, um, trying to start a conversation. Um, and, it, and it's been proper inspiring to see it being led by young people, people like us, not, not a political party um, that, that really had, doesn't, um stand up for our interests but 
done by us and our localized campaigns on race, on inequality has, has sort of changed the perception um, a lot of us young people and a lot of people outside outside our area and whatnot see us for. So yeah, I think I think that's that's it. I mean, is there anything else you want to add? No, I think we've covered it all. Um, I just want to say thank you all for listening. And yeah. pleasure. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you all for listening. Um, and from here, I'd like to hand over to Daniel Mara from the Birmingham Branch of Equality Group. Thank you, guys. That was that was really interesting. I've mean, heard some of that stuff before, but it was it's uh, it's great to hear it all put together in the in the way you have this evening. That's um, thanks very much for your time. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Dan O'Mara, and I've, I've 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 got a few minutes this evening just to talk to you a little bit about um, the the Brum Equality Group, um, and I want to tell you a bit about the the desire I suppose that me and other people in Birmingham have at the moment for um, joining in with some activism uh, that it, to do with uh, fighting socio-economic inequality and I'm, I'm sure as you're here tonight that many of you if not all of you have um, have fairly similar feelings uh, to to my own um, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be uh, to be invited to take part in the event and, and, and to be associated with the Equality Trust, uh, with with people who are interested and passionate about this cause, and who want to promote a greater degree of fairness in our world. Um, that doesn't seem like too much to ask to me, but um, making it happen does seem like a, a rather a tall order at times. Um, Please add any questions into the chat bar as you've been asked, and I'll um, try and pick up on them um, when, when the time is right, as long as we don't run out of time. Um, th this isn't my day job, by the way. I'm, I'm in no way you know, politically employed, if, um, if that's the right expression. I'm a psychiatric nurse. I work in Birmingham in the community with um, young people with eating disorders. Um, and you, you know, it's dr driving around Birmingham, like with any city uh, in the country or the world. Um, there's there's gaping and obvious inequalities as soon as you step out of your front door. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a proud uh, employee of the NHS, if a little beleaguered, and um, it's only 16 years till retirement, so uh, the clock is the clock is ticking, folks. Uh, and I'm also a father of three. Um, but I, I'm, you know, this is this activism to me is a bit is a bit more than a hobby, though, even if it is done in my spare time. It's something I feel very strongly about and I've be become it, and my feelings have become stronger and stronger as, as time's gone on in recent years. And to be quite frank with you, I'm, uh, I'm become fed up with just watching from the sidelines and passing comment on Facebook or moaning to my friends in the pub. Uh, and, you know, I want to take part in and do something useful, work towards something better. And it turns out there's quite a lot of people out there who feel the same way. From what I've found in my limited experiences, there's lots of people who want to do something. And, um, but there's a bit of a lack of a collective voice um, people have the passionate feelings, but aren't quite sure what to do with it. They're not sure where to put that energy and where to put their time. Um, and it takes some uh, some work, I think, to find out how that energy and time can be used productively. But the passion and the belief uh, and the determination it, it is already out there, in, in, in my view. Um, I can't remember what led me to pick up the spirit level, which is a book that's already been mentioned um, by Ben earlier, and of course the um, the authors are, are present tonight. Um, but I did pick it up. I think it was like a, it was referenced in in, in uh, some other book I was, I was reading at some point. Uh, but I, I ordered it anyway, picked it up, and um, and it struck a, a really big chord with me. Um, this isn't a sales pitch on their behalf, but um, I really would recommend to you having a look at it because um, 
it's um what's what struck me most about it is is that the evidence is so great and broad and powerful in the way that um economic uh, in, uh inequalities in a society can have such a significant impact on so many aspects of the way we live uh from health to education to crime um and uh, and many more besides and um and it's presented with, with a great deal of evidence to back up the back up the claims and um it, it, it really can't be ignored so i finished that book and um i didn't want to just put it down and move on to to the next um thrilling non non-fiction um i wanted to try and do something about it um, and I've been looking to get involved in something um, fairly political and uh, an activist for some time. Wasn't really sure where to, where to put my energies, to be quite frank. Um, uh, around the time I'd, be, I'd become a bit dispirited with the Labour Party, it was just on the back of Corbyn's defeat. Um, won't go into that in any detail today. Uh, I do still remain a member of the Labour Party, um, but uh, I didn't. I wasn't sure whether putting my energy into the Labour Party was the right use, <laughs> was the best use of my time. Um, the back of the spirit level uh, is highlighted the Equality Trust, and in fact, I think the Equality Trust was born uh, as a result of of the the book. Uh, and there's a section that was um, highlighting that there are local groups to get involved with. So I thought that that's, that, sound, that sounds pretty good. So I looked, but there wasn't one in the West Midlands at all, uh, let alone Birmingham. Um, so I uh, took a deep breath and decided to take the plunge and try and, and try to set something up myself. So I talked to a couple of mates about it and, uh, and, a, and a friend and I began to establish what we call the, the Brum Equality Group. Um, just in the summer of this year, uh, very, very, very recent, very new, uh, very fledgling. Um, and to be quite frank with you, we're not really sure where it's going to take us at the moment. But, um, but what I do know is that we, we, when we discussed it, um, we felt very strongly about the huge unfairness and injustices that we see in this country and around the world. And we wanted to try and try and do something to influence some change in our city. Uh, to do something useful, uh, to try and help reduce the economic and social inequalities that we that we see any every day in in, uh, in so many forms, um, and it's. I think there were times when I thought this gosh this is just overwhelming. This is an impossible task. This can't be. This can't be achieved. What what's the point? You know, a bit like you feel about plastic recycling sometimes. You know, um, but. Um, I read something useful that was to do with um, the, you know, the collective effort being of such great importance and feeling like even the smallest, um, even the smallest changes uh, collectively can result in uh, larger, more, more powerful change. And that's, and that principle has, has kept me going uh, throughout, um, to, to be quite honest. Um, we weren't really happy with doing nothing, and we wanted to find out what was possible. Uh, we wanted to talk with and learn from people whose positions can influence change and to try and influence them. And, um, and already we've had the, had the opportunity to speak with one of the local Labour labor councillors who's got a, uh, an inequalities uh, uh, role in their portfolio. Um, and uh, we wanted to um, we wanted to learn about what was already being done in the city and how we could take part. And most importantly, we wanted to meet people from the broad ranging communities in Birmingham and learn about their individual and direct experiences of inequality. Um, so in all honesty, I'm not really sure exactly where we're headed at the moment, but um, we're enjoying the journey. We're finding there's a lot of other people out there who feel that the current global trends of economic inequality are just not acceptable. And it's not hard to find other people who feel this way. Our group is still forming ideas about what we'd like to do. We understand that this is not about individuals. Uh, it's about people working together and it's about organizations working together to harness a collective force. Uh, we're aiming to raise awareness around the city on this subject 
uh, to listen and learn from speakers, actively involved in established organisations and community projects. Uh, and we want to enjoy, uh, join in with existing campaigns and, and eventually to create and build our own. We see that change for the better can and will occur, but we also see that there are many obstacles and barriers. I mean, everyone will be aware that the pandemic has further highlighted and accentuated the, um, the existing inequalities. Um, simply more homeless people, more billionaires, you know, it's, that's, it's, as, it's as simple as that. And it's just, it's just not acceptable. Uh, but we found there are um, lots of people in our neighbourhoods that, that believe in this and want to do something about it. So the Brom Equality Group, we're new, we're patient, we're passionate, and we're in it for the long haul. And we do genuinely believe that however small, we can make something of a difference. Uh, I've met a lot of people already in the last six months and, um, and I intend to do more of that. And I've learned a great deal already and I'm looking forward to learning more. So thanks very much for listening. Uh, follow us on Twitter and Facebook, which is what you say these days and um, chuck in any questions into the chat bar if you have them. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dan. And thank you to Amy and Lawand as well. Um, really different examples of how different people are getting involved um, in this kind of, um, whether we call it activism, whether we call it engaging with people, having conversations, um, you know, it just demonstrates that there is no one right way to be involved in this, um, whether it's about, you know, encouraging people that wouldn't ordinarily get involved to, to be a part of, you know, art, um, or whether it's kind of making those links in your local community, there, there are so many different ways um, that, that, this, that, that we can all get involved in, in the fight against inequality. Um, so, I just want to again just kind of see how people are feeling at the moment before we move into the Q and A. And I've been we've been gathering your questions, um, and we'll have all our speakers. So that'll include Fran, um, Ben, Dan, Lawand, and Amy. Um, so you'll be able to ask them all questions. Um, but if you could just have a little reflection, just for one minute and just sum up in two words your feelings just after hearing from our, our guest speakers today. So if you just have a little think and then don't comment, don't put it in yet. So just type it in and then in a couple of minutes, we'll all press enter. So um, just, yeah, have a think and uh, I will come back to you. So if everybody's had a chance to think, um, you know, how you're feeling now after hearing from the guest speakers, if you've put your words in the chat, if you could press enter and then we can see all those coming through. Okay, so we're getting some more, some more kind of positivity coming through. Um, and, you know, people thinking about taking more action and feeling more able to make a difference, which is, you know, that's, that's really encouraging. Um, if anybody wants to, you know, this is, this is your event as much as this, the speakers, if anybody really would, would like to um, speak about anything that's, that struck them the most so far this evening, please do feel free. But otherwise, you know, just keep your questions coming in the chat um, as I will be handing, I'm gonna hand over now to Cerise, um, who is going to be chairing the Q&A. Thank you, Jo. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope, I hope you feel as inspired as I do right now um, after hearing from all of our guest speakers. So we truly appreciate you joining. Um, to, I'm just going to invite Dan, Ben, Lauand and 
Fran and Amy to come back and um, speak with us. Um, get the questions up. I hope you're ready. We've got lots of questions. Um, I will start firstly with Ben. Um, so the first question is, is it the case that things have to get even worse before people rise up and demand change? So that's partly true, but there's a really important caution there, which is that if we just let people know how bad things are, there's a danger that that on its own could lead people to despair. That all of the, the both history, but also psychology demonstrates that in order for people to work for change, they not only have to believe that their current state is unfair, but they also have to believe that it is possible to move to a different, fairer state. If they have no, if they have no hope, then they'll be paralyzed. Now, how do you give people hope? A really important part about giving people hope is that actually it's not about a great speech. So sometimes people think it's about, oh, if I can just win people over with an argument, that will give people hope. That's not how it works in practice. In practice, the way that you give people hope is by accompanying them and by helping them win something, however small. So if you want people to organize for a fairer society, the best way to start is to find out what people around you care about. Around you could mean in your workplace where people want better wages or better health and safety or um, to, to be able to have more time with their kids when they're born or more um, uh, care in this, in this COVID crisis. It might mean in your neighborhood about protecting a, a, a park or a kid's play area or a nursery school. It could be in your faith community, whatever it is, that the people that are around you, ask what they care about and then see if by helping bring people together, you can help win something. Through that process of change, through that process of winning, people will start to feel that something is possible. So it is true that we have, especially now in this COVID crisis, reached a real disastrous point in inequality, not just from COVID actually, but from the past um, uh, decades of neoliberalism. But when you add those two things together, we have reached a really awful place but we have to be able to say to people, not just that, that, that we are in an awful place, but that a better place is, is possible and here's how we might get there. And we have to help people see little steps along the, the journey. So um, that would be my, my encouragement to you, not just to let people know how broken things are, but let people know that it's mendable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, so I'm just going to now invite um, everyone else to um, speak as well, because these questions aren't directed at anyone. Um, if you feel like you are best placed to answer this question, feel free. Fran, Colin or um, Amy or Lawand or Dan, that would be really great. Um, so the first question that we have is, is there a, is there a plan or strategy to fight inequality in the UK? How will this be achieved and when? So I don't know if anyone would like to answer this question. I'll say a few things. And I suppose the strategy is just the, the kind of conversation we're having now and just everything that Bernard just said. We should be, we can ask for a strategy from government and we can keep doing that and we should keep doing that but it has to come from us, it has to come from our beliefs, from our commitment and our, our values. So to build that strategy, we should be working together. You know, loads of the conversations in the chat have been really about uniting and how do we share this? How do we think together? And there's lots of different ways to do that. And, and one way which you can do it through the Equality Trust is through those local groups. And Emma Marks, our local groups organizer, has just put in the chat about contacting her to do that. The strategy to fight inequality has to come from us. It has to come from our, our want. And that's the only way to achieve it. So I think, yes, let's keep pushing the government to do what we, we know they should, whether or not they will. But let's also think, how do we address this? How do we fix it? Because it matters to us. It's our lives. It's our children's lives. It's our family's lives. So we should care and we should build that strategy. 
Thank you, Fran. Does anyone else want to add on to that? I think for me, it's it's um, it's 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 discovering all the things that are already are occurring as well. It's 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 um, you know you have these conversations and it feels like we're at the beginning of something, but the you know it doesn't you know it takes a little bit of work, but you discover how many you know multiple multiple projects there are going on in every in every city in, across the country. Um, you know, tackling all at all different aspects of of inequality um you know it's 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 inspiring but it, and it's in some ways it's rather hidden as well and it's um but it's it's per, personally speaking that's filled me with an encouragement because every week i uncover something else that and another yet another group of people that are working hard on some on a project or a, a community initiative that's that with that's making a small difference somewhere else you know Thank you, Dan. Um, so I'm going to throw it off a bit and Jackie's got her hand up. So Jackie, I'm going to come to you. If you want to say your question, feel free. Um, thanks very much. Yes, I mean, I was really put my hand up after Ben was speaking because I really agree very much that you need to involve people. Um, our campaign is actually fairer housing and it's because I work for a housing charity and we have a we give people legal advice and financial advice. But, you know, the pandemic that threw such a light on the, the, the gap, the housing unfairness, along with, you know, as, as just one key example of, of inequality, that I felt we, we, you know, we weren't doing enough. We had to do more. But also we had to make sure that the people, as somebody else said earlier, the people who are suffering most from inequality have to be in the driving seat from day one. They don't get invited to a party by a lot of white people who, who live in a, a decent home already. So we worked with the local community groups. We got people in temporary housing, people in appalling conditions, overcrowded, et cetera. And because people have been so oppressed and because you know, it, it's really only people of my age, I'm nearly 80, I can remember when we had a real welfare state in this country, when I was a little girl, my father was so proud, he wasn't particularly left wing or anything, but because the welfare state was new to my parents, they were so proud, they said to me, Jacqueline, do you know you could never starve in this country because the state wouldn't let it happen? Mm -hmm. If he could see today food banks, for heaven's yeah. sake, he would be turning in his grave. So we need, you know, so younger people don't necessarily know that things can be better. And people living in poor housing, of course, because perhaps they've been try to get council housing and they can't get it. They're blaming the council. So we've brought people together to explore with them, why do we have a housing crisis? What is it? Why doesn't the council just build enough council houses for everybody? Why do landlords charge so much rent? Why, you know, and that took us to looking at property developers and land banking. And now people are beginning to understand and realize things can change. And yes, we've been going, we're still new, we've been going for a year and we've just now put in place a kind of framework for a business plan and work out what we really want to achieve, concrete things over the next three years. And, uh, and I just, um, uh, because we want to expand across the whole country, at the moment we're just in, in West London, um, I'm certainly going to be writing to Dan and, and seeing whether you can get people in poor housing involved in our campaign and anybody else in this group. So really my question was, you know, there's lots of groups that may be working in housing, there's groups calling for a fair income, there's people calling for social guarantee, all in our own little corners. And if there was some way we could just all be aware of each other, but be identified and maybe, you know, just say, look, you know, the 5th of September is going to be the day when we all stand up and be counted. We all get our placards out or we all write to the prime minister, whatever it is, you know, that could be so much stronger. And, and maybe it, the Equalities Trust is the, the vehicle that could help bring that together. I don't know. But but anyway, all, all strength. Thank you. 
Well, bow everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. That was really um, inspiring to hear. And I think, Dan, maybe you might be best to answer this because, um, for example, we bring um, local groups together to talk and speak about different issues and everybody is focusing on different things. But, um, Dan, I don't know if you want to add anything to how um, they, we can bring people together collectively um, from different groups. Um, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think I've got an expert solution on, on that particular one. I, I mean, it's 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 one. It's one of the things that I I hope to achieve with our group, is 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 using um, using social media and other methods to draw together the the um, all the various projects and organisations that are happening in the city. Just as a, you know, if only to raise the awareness of them. Um, but ha having done that quite recently, Jackie, and there's, there's been quite a recently launched campaign for better housing in Birmingham. Um, that all up, that all up. I don't, I don't, I only know them by through a couple of texts. Um, but I've, but I, I've come across them, like I've come across a lot of things. And um, I, I, if you contact me, I'll, I'll, I'll share their details with you, and you can have a have a chat with them. Thank you, Dan. So I'm going to go on to the next question, which is the biggest challenge we face is misinformation since the creation of the Internet. So when we talk about inequality, a lot of people feel their freedoms will be taken. How do we tackle this? Can you say <laughs> that again? Can you say that again? Starting. Yeah. So the biggest challenge we face is misinformation since the creation of the internet. So when we talk about inequality, a lot of people feel their freedoms will be taken. How do we tackle that? How do we tackle people feeling that if they fight inequality, their freedoms gonna, they will be stripped of their freedom? I think they're coming from the wrong standpoint altogether. I'm not sure they, they understand what equality is. Um, I don't know if anyone on the panel wants to answer that question. I think it's a great point about lies and the power of lies. But here's something else about lies, which is that the people who are most vulnerable, most susceptible to that kind of misinformation, and sometimes it's, it's stuff like that, it's conspiracy stuff like that, sometimes it's racist or xenophobic, sexist or homophobic. The people who are most vulnerable to that are people who are atomized. In other words, they're not part of something. Oh. There's really interesting research. If you look at white working class people, they're much less likely to be led astray by racist, xenophobic movements if they're part of a trade union. Because when you're, when you're part of something, when you, when you belong, then you don't get stuck in, 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 with these kind of uh, false uh, narratives. But the idea that we can only be free if we're unequal is such errant nonsense. It's the freedom of the little boy who was stuck down the mines you know, America says they're free because they don't force people to have government health care. What's the consequence? Twice as many mums die giving birth per person in America as die in any other industrialized country. In other words, those freedom lovers that say don't let the state give you health care, they are happy to see twice as many mums die giving birth. These are people, by the way, who call themselves pro-life. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, this, this idea that we're better off when we're all separated is a rich man's idea. Working class people and middle class people, by the way, too, you need to look yourselves in the mirror and you need to say to yourself, on my own, there's no way out of this. On my own, there's no way out of this. I will only get out of this together in solidarity with others. So we only get freedom from belonging, from community. But if we're going to break through that misinformation, we shouldn't do it by hectoring and lecturing people and telling them that they're, that they're idiots and that they're stupid. We, we need to be there for people. When we first start organizing with people, some of those people that we're starting to organize with, for example, to protect the nursery or the local park or improve the school, some of those people that you'll work with will have attitudes that are racist or sexist or, or, or homophobic. And we need to work with imperfect people and through the process of organizing, help people see. And the way that you demonstrate that you're on someone's side is by being by their side. So I think this misinformation, which is, which is horrific, it won't be beaten 
with fact check, you know, and zingers and quote tweeting people and laughing at them. It will be beaten by reaching out and showing them that these these liars are not on their side and, and, and we are. Thank you, Ben. Um, so the next question is, do we really know what the government should do? Have we agreed amongst ourselves about what, what they should do? So a couple of things here, what I know that we all at the Equality Trust are really committed to. So we could, for example, ask them to commence the socioeconomic duty. We've had legislation in force since 2010. This act is there, which would um, force local authorities, public bodies to pay attention to their actions and make sure that they didn't increase socioeconomic inequality. That legislation exists. The act is there, but it's not been enforced. It was most recently enforced in, in Wales from, I think, the end of March, but we've not done it in England, so we could do that. We could also lobby our local authorities to do that. We could strengthen workers' rights. We'd encourage people to unionise, to stand together, to act together. We could reintroduce the top rate of tax. We could actually think more about taxing wealth in line with income. We could look at all of the debates that have been going on around universal credit, around um, national insurance contributions, and really think about a properly progressive tax system. Um, we could think about social security. You know, it's what, it's 80 years since the beverage report next year. It's 80 years since we've had the, the birth of that welfare state that we were talking about before. Let's actually have a welfare state fit for purpose that does not have huge holes in it allowing people to fall through those are the sorts of things that i think that we should all agree that the government should do and there's probably many more that people can bring to the conversation thank you also, by the way all of those are massively popular they're hugely popular for example taxing the rich is hugely popular including amongst conservative voters increasing the minimum wage is hugely popular including amongst conservative voters there was a, a, a poll done in the States and they said, how much more should the boss make than the workers, right? And people who are Democrats, they said, I think maybe nine times more. And people who are Republicans, they were like, I think it should be 18 times more. That sounds like a big divide, right? Republicans are saying bosses should get 18 times more than workers. Democrats are saying nine times more than workers. But here's the facts, right? It's 300 times more is what they get right now. So in other words, if you reduced that, that wage inequality in the US to what Republican voters think, not the party leaders, but the ordinary voters, it'd be a social revolution. So all the stuff that Fran is talking about is hugely popular. It's not complicated, it's not rocket science, and we've got 150 years of history of what works. So when, if you see a country getting less equal, those in charge of it are doing it on purpose. But the sad thing is, is that the only time we've ever got anything better is we've had to push for it. It's never been given. It's never relied only on people coming to rescue us and, and it won't this time either. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Fran. Um, I'll move on to the next question, which is um, from what everyone has discussed today, it sounds like there's a lot of linkages possible across areas on specific subsets of inequality. How do we map these out? I could say a couple of things again for how we, we, we might want to think about that. You know, with an academic background thinking about this, we might want to use the, the word of intersectionality and think about how everything is linked. The, the, the problem with inequality and, and talking about inequality is it means so many different things. So it's impossible not to have all these interrelated domains of life linking together. And we can look to kind of existing frameworks on this, you know, um, the social determinants of health. Somebody's talking about um, Michael Marmot in the chat, that kind of framework around thinking, how is everything linked? What are the different levels at which uh, influences matter for our lives you know kind of like personal family community place-based political how are they all interrelated so it's about using the kind of existing 
theoretical frameworks, I suppose, but taking them beyond the academic experts that people are talking about in the chat and kind of making that real to people and having conversations, maybe even co-producing those frameworks, you know, with the groups that we have on this kind of conversation, what is it, how do these different arenas of inequality link for individuals? And to do that, we just need to talk to each other. I think so much of these co the questions that are coming through just show we should chat, we should talk, we should discuss how to do this together, because probably in this call now of what 65 people, there's loads of excellent ideas, loads of um, understanding, experience, expertise that we can link together to map out those domains and work out where do we target our action, where we are, because it matters where you are, you know, people in places, that matters for inequality. I want to link that to the issue of power, which is that Sometimes people think, whose issue is going to win? My issue or their issue? In other words, will it be environmentalism? Will it be labour rights? Will it be pensions? Will it be things for kids? What, what, will, what will win? And the truth is that every time we've won, we've won together. We've won all these things together, or we've won none of them. And so the, the way to win is to, is to build what the Reverend William Barber in the States calls fusion coalitions. We need to bring together all these different groups. So, for example... If you're somebody who is working, supporting pensioners to live in dignity, when your grandkids say that they're marching for the climate, go with them. If you are a white organiser that is working to protect your local schools, then when you hear that there's a Black Lives Matter march about police violence, join it. If you're a man who is working for getting better pay at work, when you hear that there is a, a women's protest, go along. It's, it's, when we, it's when we come together that we have the potential to be strong. So this isn't just the right thing to do ethically. This is really the only way in which we'll ever succeed in any of our causes. So the trick is, in a way, the trick to persuading people to join your cause is the first conversation, not even tell them what your cause is. Ask them what they care about and help. Thank you, Ben, thank you. Um, just a note, if we haven't asked your question yet and you still wanna ask it, please um, put it in the chat just in case you've missed it or raise your hand, we, will, we can come to you and you can ask your question. Um, but before then, I will move on to the next question, which is how important is it to raise inequality with your local MP? And if it is, what is the best strategy to use? I'll just say very important, I think, you know, they, they speak for us, we vote for them. So if we care about inequality, they should care about inequality. So I think, firstly, yes, it's extremely important. And strategies, you know, you can do things like write to them, make them know who you are, you know, do, you know, your name in their inbox, maybe something that they're a bit like, oh, gosh, it's them again, but they're making their point and go to their surgeries, be involved. I think it really does matter. And if, if the politicians can stand by and say, oh, we don't hear this from our constituents, they don't have that mandate to act, give them that mandate, take it beyond partisan politics, because you voted them in or you didn't, but they still act for you, they still represent you. Thank you, Fran. Um, Maureen, you have your hand up. You're muted, sorry. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I entirely agree with um, Dr. Fran there because that's the way that I am working. I'm dealing with the town council and I've now got to the point because we have come up with, the, the group has come up with different things and we've kind of contacted them regularly. And now I've now had the town count the town clerk ring me to see if I could um, prepare something for him to get something in that was about money coming from the government about disabled toilets, you know, and what kind of statement. And it's as if people don't really understand entirely what equality is, and they're not confident enough to deal with it. So I think it is about. I don't think it's going to the government. I think it's going to the council. And therefore, in our case, it's a small town, it's Oswestry. And then from there, that goes to the council, the Shropshire Council. 
And then, then, you know, we have all Conservatives. We're hoping to get a Labour representative because we've now, it's, we're now where the North Shropshire one, Owen Patterson won. So we're hoping to replace him. But I honestly don't, I think we have to work from a small, a low level and keep building it up. And until we are seen to be representing something which people are not confident about and they need your help, I think that's the way you get things changed. But, um, you know, equality has always been within my mind for all my life as, as in education, because I was a teacher and then an advisor. But it's still hard, I think, for people to understand. And I think the point I was making earlier, I think the pandemic has made people look more towards themselves and look after themselves than they are about concerns about other people. I mean, I'm particularly people that do, but there's many people that, that find it hard to think further than their own situation. But um, no, I, I disagree with you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question, which was directed at Ben. But if anyone wants to come in and has any points, um, please do. Um, participation and understanding power and claiming our power is key to change. Our aim, um, so they have a group, is to have equal ability to participate in society working from grassroots. Ben, are there examples of this that you have come across? like a perfect equality there's never been a society where everybody has exactly the the, the same but um, we have had periods in almost every country in the world where because the people push the government the government reduce inequality now um, folks were talking about MPs and parties so just to put in a bit of history here that I think is quite an interesting thing, that when trade unions are strong, you can plot this on a graph, when trade unions are strong, in other words, when the proportion of the country that's a member of a trade union, when it's high, inequality goes down. And when a proportion of the population that's a member of a trade union is low, inequality goes up. And something really interesting here, which is that in the 1950s and 1960s, and I love the historical references from Jackie, thank you, in the 1950s and 1960s, you'll actually see in Britain, France, um, the US, Canada, Australia, and others, that the centre-right party, so in Britain, the Tories, in the US, the Republicans, in France, the, the, the Gaullists, and, and or the Germany, the Christian Democrats, the centre-right parties, as well as the centre-left parties, so Labour or the Democrats or, or, or SDP or others, pursued policies that you could call social democracy. That's things like public housing, so expanding uh, healthcare, um, taxing the rich, lifting the wages of the poor, uh, all of those things that reduced inequality under both parties in the 50s and 60s. Once you get to the 80s and 90s, under both parties, inequality continues to go up. So it's not just about picking one party or another. It is also always about your negotiating power, your strength. Jay Naidu, he's a brilliant guy. He helped run the trade unions that helped bring down apartheid. And he said to me, look, Ben, when you're in a conversation with these guys, remember this, it's not about the quality of your PowerPoint. It's about the extent of your power. And so in every single process, just remember it's a negotiation and, and, and strength respects strength. So you will be able to win things when more and more people come in your group. The, the more people that you have, the more you'll be able to change. So there isn't like um, an ideal where maybe one day the government will establish, you know, really wonderful participatory mechanisms. These have to be won. One of my favorite quotes is from someone called Shirley Chisholm. She's an African-American activist. She said this, she said, don't wait for someone to offer you a seat, bring along a fold up chair. Thank you, Ben. And on that note, I'm going to round up questions because we have one minute before I hand over to Fran. Thank you so much to everyone for 
um, sending over your questions. Again, if you do have any questions that you want to um, answer, I'm sure you can at either Dan, Fran or Ben on Twitter and, or send them a message and they will be more than happy to respond. Um, also, if you do send us an email, we will try and get back to you and answer any of your questions. Um, but for now, thank you. Thank you to our guest speakers and I'm going to hand back over to Fran. Thanks, Cerise. Um, so it's really just down to me to, to close the event. I think the first thing to say is thank you so much to our speakers, to Ben, to Dan, to Amy and to Lawan, to, to hear the, the kind of the work that they've done. It really is inspiring. And I really think that all of those kind of really distressing words we heard at the start, how everyone was feeling, use that inspiration from them to kind of work off that let's kind of really come together and and think about how we can unite to tackle inequality to dismantle structural inequality to really see a better future for the for our children and for and for us you know it's not just our children it is our own lives as well and we should care about that so I really, really do appreciate everyone coming on, on this Tuesday. It has been a really great conversation. I hope you're feeling as inspired as we are. There is um, lots of things you can get involved with. Do get involved with your Quality Trust. If you're not already involved with us, do think about the local groups that you might want to set up. Do you think about the kind of campaigns you want to flag to us that you're working on, the things that you're doing? What are you doing to see change in your area um, with everyone? So I think that's the main thing. So again, Thank you, everyone. Thank you for our speakers. And I think the best thing is to look forward to working with you all to fight inequality over the next few years. Thank you, Fran. There is just a final um, poll going up. If you can let us know, if you feel more inspired, hopefully you do. Hopefully your feelings from the beginning of the event has changed. Um, and I echo what Fran says, we really appreciate everyone coming and just joining in to understand and find out why you are all vital to the fight um, against inequality. And yeah, if you can finish off that poll. That is, up. that is it from us. The recording will be available. We will follow up with an email so that everybody has access to it. Um, thank you again so much for attending.